Hi guys, as usual you're listening to Vol and I want to give you a very special battle report on War Machine of Hordes recently uh, because the other night I went round to my uh, one of my usual gaming practice arenas and played a unprecedented for me uh, game of War Machine that uh, featured 150 points per side and uh, that also featured three different casters so just to give you an idea of how that works you choose three of your Warlocks or Warcasters each Warlock or Warcaster has to have his or her own battle group and then beyond on that you can then spend um, the rest of your points on uh, units and solos and battle engines. Now of course I'm playing uh, Circle of Orbros for this one and to actually reach 150 points I even had to borrow um, a small unit of Gatorman. What I uh, did was obviously I printed out the list and when I showed up uh, to play the game um, one of the guys was meant to lend me um, a minion model, model for um, Daryl Hallier and Scarath or whatever the name of that uh, snake charmer lady is but it didn't show up so I had to borrow some um, uh, gator men and I think I was meant to drop a, a two point solo to fit it in but either way um, I probably would have got, wouldn't have got the points to bang on just with a little bit of Im impromptu uh, messing around with the models. My opponent uh, for this one, uh, a, a, pl a player that I play against quite frequently, um, he's got his mercenaries out. Um, he tells me that he could have actually fielded well over 200 um, you know, points worth of models. He's got a very big collection of guys and um, what we did is we showed up here at about 7.30, all deployed, and um, the plan was basically to continue until maybe about 1 o'clock in the morning or whenever the game finished and uh, just see who was uh, ahead at that point. So to help, um, we're playing a customized scenario which looks like Incursion. If you look in the middle of the field, there are three medium bases representing the three flags. In Incursion, after the first turn, you take one of the flags away randomly. However, for this particular scenario, uh, all three flags will stay on the field. That's our customization of it and um, it's not first to three, three control points to win in fact what actually happens here is that you continue scoring control points until the end of the night by the time we've agreed that it's time to go home whoever has the most control points will be the winner and um, that is only the secondary tiebreaker of course we both have three casters each so whoever has got the most caster kills will be declared the winner even if he is behind on control points it's just that um, you know it's likely that we'll either have you know both players casters on the field all three of them each side and be at a tie break situation so that's when the control points will come in failing that we can then try and get our calculators out and work out um, you know victory points just going to the next photo, um, I've actually forgotten my uh, camera disc, so I'm using my iPhone for this one. Picture's a little bit blurry, but uh, I hope you guys can appreciate the, the scale of the game. Um, he's got a lot of infantry for this one. He's deployed all of his warjacks centrally. And um, if you check the video description, um, I'm running uh, P. Balder, Epic Kruger, and Cassius, and my opponent is running Ashlyn... Gorton and Damiano, uh, so all of those guys featuring battle groups, and uh, it's going to be a, a massive one. But looking forward to doing this for some time. And in fact, my actual collection of models doesn't even stretch to 150 points, which is why I had to borrow um, a few extra models. Next image, just a bit more of a zoom in. He's deployed Ashland to the left, Gorton in the middle, and Damiano to the right of Gorman. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Damiano is to the right of uh, Gorton, but to the left of Gorman, and um, they're surrounded by a, uh, a whole sort of contingent of vanguards and mules and uh, and manglers. So, plenty of heavy metal in the centre. Gun majors supporting from the back. This is a highborn covenant uh, mercenary contract. So the entire 150 points belongs to the the covenant. And you know this was done on um, on uh, what's the website's name? Fordcommander.com. So hopefully you know everything should be legal. Next image, um, a bit more of a close-up, well, a bit of a, a look at the side of the field. He's got his group of um, Ogren Assault Corps, and these guys are going to be bringing up the flank. Um, he's taken the second turn, so he's chosen to deploy them opposite my, uh, my flank there as well. Next image, um, another look at my army. Obviously, you can see the Celestial Fulcrum. I really love having the Celestial Fulcrum in here because it's just a striking model in, in such a large scale game because your eye is always drawn to it and it's the constant reminder of how big it is relative to your other models. Um, I've got a big line of advanced deployment, you know, nearly a third of my stuff or models that is our advanced deployment at the front. Cassius is tree, the Druids, Blood Trackers, the Than Ravages as well and behind that is just a massive wall of flesh, uh, heavy war beasts galore so that should be a lot of fun but it's going to be a massive traffic jam in the centre. 
Next image, just a bit more of a close-up here, you can see Kruger, uh, just to the left the fulcrum. Um, fulcrum's looking quite nice in this lighting with the, um, the colour. And uh, Balder, just standing between the fulcrum and Megalith, and uh, between Megalith and the World Guardian in the background, you can see the form of Cassius just uh, hanging back behind his tree. And I've got two sets of stones, of course. I think legally you're allowed to, allowed to choose a lot more units of stones, but I only uh, own two sets, otherwise, you know, things could get really, really funky. Next image, uh, Circle Orbros with the first turn, you can see the very familiar sight of um, the unit of Druids just pushing forward and putting up a cloud wall, and uh, Baldur, of course, moving forward and putting down a forest, so that larger template you see to the right hand side of the photo, that's actually uh, Baldur's uh, four inch forest template. And um, one really very powerful thing about this combination of Circle Casters is that you can combine solid ground from, um, from uh, Baldur, which will affect the whole army, almost, or the whole centre of the army, which is just absolutely essential against all of his mortars and mules and AoEs. And at the same time, um, I've got Kruger there for Stormwall, so anything shooting from the centre um, will be out of range, and of course, I can make sure the, the AoEs deviate you know, to within something that is captured by uh, solid ground. So that's one of the really zany and fun things about playing at a 150 points level, is you can combine uh, Warcaster abilities, uh, Warlock abilities, which wouldn't normally be, um, you know, very fair and balanced, but in this sort of situation, they're really cool. Um, so, very, very defensive, though. If you play Kador, you can come up with some really nasty offensive combinations. I've actually got stone skin on the uh, Celestial Fulcrum as well, because um, it's hard to block line of sight to it in particular. Next image, just a bit more of a look on, on what's going on here. I've got some trackers who are moving them through to the center. I've done that just because I want to um, avoid getting shot at by um, his AoEs uh, that the Ogrens are presenting around the side because they're not within solid ground range. But um, once the Halberdiers come screaming through the, uh, the forest there or around the forest, uh, hopefully I should have, have a bit of a fight uh, with them using the blood trackers. Next image, uh, a bit of an image of the centre of the field. We've got the tree which has been teleported up with the stones. Uh, Cassius has followed up and all three of my casters are on the hill. You've got Kruger to the left, Baldur and, and Cassius and uh, the Druids just hanging up out front like they always do. Next image, um, just a bit of a view of the Gatorman. I actually placed these on the field uh, turn two after forgetting that I actually was entitled to another nine points of guys or seven or whatever I had, I had left. So uh, the Gatorman just got uh, chucked in here. I think I ended up going for the minimum unit because I still had my black clad on the field, which I was initially planning on dropping in favor of, because I think I had five points spare, so I could drop the black clad and put seven points in, but I decided to uh, do it around a different way, drop something else. Can't quite remember what happened. I think there was going to be feral geist in there, then he was taken out, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's uh, how this is looking. Haven't played the Nailhorn setter in so long, but it's, it's just great to see him back on the field. Next image, Mercenaries turn, turn one, everything comes screaming forward. Um, he's moved his uh, driller and uh, mule out aggressively, but everything else is just camping on the hill there. Gore 10 is put down uh, solid ground, which he'll keep permanently with um, Wish Nailer. I've got no way of removing upkeeps in this list, or in this faction, that is, except with Dispel. Don't even have any Bloodweavers. Don't own them. And um, all of his Warcasters are camped behind the wall. Um, you know, there's no way I can really assassinate his Warcasters in this sort of situation. They've just got too much protection there. And uh, on the flanks, uh, a huge, big column of infantry steelheads are moving forward. Uh, obviously with Damiano's coins backing them up at some stage. On the right-hand side, we've got the Rulik infantry moving around. If He's got the, uh, the Hammerfall guys as well. So next image, um, looking at what's happening behind the scenes here, the Ogrens are moving around to uh, threaten this left-hand side flag uh, from his perspective. He's also got uh, Selena and the Nis Hunters moving through the forest, but he's only taken a minimum unit. Not too, too sure why he's only got the minimum unit. Maybe he doesn't own the maximum unit. That's probably the reason. And he's uh, even got Iris uh, creeping around somewhere as well. I'm very worried about uh, Selena and her group because uh, she can ignore stealth, and that will allow her to actually put some damage on the tree. I believe that if you ignore stealth, Stealth, you also ignore, um, you know, Prowl, Camouflage, and so forth. So, um, you yeah, with Hunter, that is. Um, actually, no, Selena doesn't ignore Stealth. It's something else it does, but I was worried that Selena's group would actually get some shots off um, on, you know, some of the guys that uh, would normally be protected by uh, Clouds. That's what I was trying to say there. Maybe the Druids. Next image, um, my turn two, I've aggressively moved forward with the Druids who have... Uh, 
use their force bolt ability to actually drag the driller all the way through to this uh, uh, point here next to the flag and then the Warp Wolf Stalker has been teleported next to him without primal and has just swung away with him with his massive sword and wrecked the driller. So that's the first casualty of the game. Nice and decisive and of course the droids to do this weren't able to put down their clouds but uh, during my turn two Baldur pops his feet which means that Everything within 12 inches of Baldur, which is the main uh, uh, battle group in the center, uh, you know, provided with cover. So the droids actually get cover plus camouflage from cover, so they're still defense 20, and any AoEs won't be able to touch them because of solid ground. And um, of course, everything within Baldur's control area is difficult ground. Enemies can't gain Pathfinder while in it. So the plan here overall is just to move forward in the first turn, put up solid ground on Stormwall, he can't shoot me. Second turn, put down. Um, uh, you know, Baldur's feet, so I can't do that as either. In fact, um, I tell a lie, I've, I've done it the wrong way. Um, in turn two, I didn't use Baldur's feet, I used Cassius's feet, so the tree comes up. In fact, if you go to the next photo here, I've teleported the tree down the bottom right um, up close to the flag, and then I've, I've run the uh, tree walking um, thumb ravages into it so that uh, the tree's blocking line of sight to them and they get plus two defense anyway from tree walker. And of course, the, uh, you know, the, the druids are, s are very safe there because of the tree and um, everything's fine and dandy but it's it, the following turn after that that I can use Baldur's feet of course and the idea behind this game is that um, I can play it very defensively and just control the flags and prevent him from getting to, to me now that is a bit a bit lackluster for a, uh, a brawl of a 150 point game but it's my first time at 150 maybe next time I'll try something more aggressive but um, you know the prospect prospect of being shot to bits by all of those jacks um, is not much fun so decided just to play it carefully and see how the evening goes we're only about an hour into the game anyway. So next image, um, all of the circle forces surging through on the right hand flank, but uh, not everything is uh, covered by the, the tree's feet range. So if you see where the feet is over where Kruger's standing over to the left, uh, the forest really only extends to the edge, the right hand edge of that wall in the center of the field, that obstruction. So all of his steelheads and so forth coming around the flank can actually engage and attack my blood trackers and feral warp wolf. So next image, that's exactly what they do. Um, these guys are affected by uh, Damiano's Death March spell, I think it is. So they have got Extra Mat and Vengeance. Um, the Rupert has given them Tough, or even Pathfinder in this situation, and they have rushed forward with Powerful Charge, uh, killing quite a lot of blood, blood trackers, and the three of them on the right actually seriously wounding the Feral Warp Wolf. So quite a, a decisive uh, flank move here. Next image, uh, just zooming out, um, the Ogrins move forward, Harland Versh moves forward, uh, the Selena and the Niss Hunters move forward to CRA, and the uh, Feral Warp Wolf was reduced to about four boxes of life left, um, so he is not feeling very good, but um, he's the only one who's really taken a, a hit. I've lost a couple of blood trackers, but that's about it. So next image, um, having a look at the left hand flank here, um, my totem hunter has moved next to the flag to capture a point from it. The tree is actually, uh, has feeded and has actually given the totem hunter some protection here. And uh, his big column of um, hammerfall guys not really able to do any business because they can't actually get proper line of sight uh, to what they need to. So a nice stalling tactic on the left. Next image in the center, um, Gorton moves forward, and my, my opponent's sort of panicking a little bit here uh, without, you know, he was very worried that he couldn't actually do anything this turn, so just to compensate for that, Gorton has used his feet to push a lot of my troops back. So that means my Stalker can't charge, none of my Thun Ravagers can charge. I think he, uh, he might have clipped the Totem, no, he wouldn't have clipped the Totem Hunter either. Gorman moves into the forest and pops his Cloud. Unfortunately, can't throw a Black Oil because, number one, um, my I can actually shift the distance of the AoE myself with Kruger and number two he can't see anything but um, even though Gorton is very close here I could teleport the stalker next to him you've got to remember Gorton is camping almost all of his focus he's got um, you know protective guys around him solid ground is up can't knock him down and um, all sorts of fun stuff is happening here so um, that's another game slowdowner in fact if you think about it um, Turn two, I feated with Cassius. Then in his turn two, he's feated with Gorton. In my next turn, I'm going to feat with Baldur, and then he can feat with either Damiano or Ashland. So over the next three turns, it's going to be a really slow, trudging game, which <laughs> isn't uh, particularly exciting for 150, but we'll see where it goes. I mean, in, in the situation with this matchup, that's the way you have to play it. If you get too aggressive, you know, you just get stomped on. 
Next image, uh, Lord of the Feast has the tracker animus placed on him by the Argus and has shot the um, the mule with his uh, raven, allowing him to be placed right next to this big group of infantry. So um, he thrashes everything in line of sight, which is 360, including Thor Steinhammer next to him that you can't see behind him, and he wipes out about 10... Uh, 10 models in this situation, which I thought was awesome. Very good effort from the Lord of the Feast, definitely getting his points back in this situation. A lot of fun. Next image, my turn three, and uh, Baldur has put down another uh, quick growth forest in the middle, which the uh, Thun Ravagers have camped around. They can't charge, but they're really just acting as a meat shield. Uh, not a very good meat shield, but I'm going to sacrifice them. If he moves forward, I'm going to attack in the following turn. Baldo has feated, so he can now shoot at me, but everything's got cover, everything's upkept, solid ground, and um, to the right-hand side you can see the blood trackers and the gatermen have actually wiped out almost all of the um, steelhead cav, which has actually maxed the tree out on souls. Souls. Really love the tree. Uh, the swamp gov has moved up and put down a cloud, so the, the tree is stealth. It doesn't really have any way of ignoring that, and of course blast damage is ignored. Solid ground. Just amazing spell in this large game. Both sides have it, and that's probably why there are so few casualties. Next image, on the left-hand side flank, um, the wolf riders have to be very cautious here because if they engage, they get bogged down with a big column of infantry. They've preyed, um, I believe, the, um, the mortar target on the left, so I'm sending one wolf rider in to throw a jab and then move back every turn. And I'm killing one crew member every turn and a couple of hammerfall uh, shield guard guys. And uh, you can see a dice on the, uh, the actual control point there with one, just to show that I've actually achieved it. Made a mistake here by uh, moving in and leaping with the totem hunter over next to the other the Mortar crew couldn't really quite do any damage there. Picked off a couple of casualties, but I'm then going to lose the Totem Hunter to his forces. So that's a bit of a shame. And uh, this Warp Wolf Stalker in the forest, have to keep it back because if he commits one of his casters or a lot of his jacks, I need that heavy, heavy hitting potential. I can't swap a Stalker for a Mule. It just doesn't work like that. You can't play like that if you uh, circle. Next image, um, very nice uh, image of the tree, finally a little bit of clarity with the photos. You can see that I've got all three of my warlocks camping around a little sort of council hoedown uh, with uh, the tree, basically their little council of greenness. And um, they're basically just camping focus, camping fury rather, and uh, it's a sad, sad thing to have to do in such a large, uh, epically cool game. But, um, you know, it's clearly an advantage to be having your warlocks safe, um, almost immune to shooting at this point, very, very high defense, tons of transfers, and just um, have a bit of fun like picking things off in the front lines and trading units and allowing the game to go deep into reserve. Next image, the Gatormen have done a great job actually wiping out um, a lot of the Steelheads, but now the payback uh, is coming in the form of the Ogrens walking over the hill um, as well as the Nis Hunters. Next image, here's the retaliation on the right-hand flank where things are actually a little bit more interesting. Um, Iris moves forward and shoots somebody. Uh, the, steel, the second group of still heads pour in and the, um, the cavalry themselves uh, rush in as well with flank moving and uh, wiping out most of the blood trackers, um, losing a couple of gatormen as well after this turn uh, to Selena and her crew. And um, my opponent almost looking to pick up a point here, but didn't quite kill that one Gatorman who survived with some health left in range of the flag. So a nice aggressive move for my opponent. Um, good to see him actually doing something. This is about the only flank he could really do anything, but um, you know, at least he tried there. So next image, um, Ashlyn has moved in. And um, Ashlyn does pop her feet. She takes one swing at the um, the Thun Ravager and kills him, and camps the rest of her focus. And the vanguard moves up. Now you're probably thinking, "Wow, Ashlyn is really vulnerable here. It's a dumb move for my opponent. I could easily just uh, ruin him." But um, what ended up happening, I believe, is that Damiano feated. Um, maybe even the same turn that Ashlyn did. So I can't move Ashlyn because of Damiano's feet. So I can't throw her into my lines outside of solid ground. I can't force bolt her with the druids. I can't knock her down because of solid ground. She's defense 17 plus 2 for, um, for quicken. And there's a vanguard nearby. So if I shoot her with a uh, Doppler bark from the Argus, you know, he's going to vanguard that. He's going to shield guard it. So he's actually committed one of his casters and said, yeah, come to me. But after thinking about it, I really couldn't assassinate her. It's just, <laughs> it's just a crazy, crazy problem that, you know, defense 19, you just have to try and roll for it. And with Ashlyn's feet up, you're rolling an extra two dice and taking away your two high. So good luck getting a double six. It's just not going to happen. 
Next image, uh, nice foreground shot of the uh, the fulcrum here, as usual, really, really proud of it. But um, as you can see, I'm, I'm camping with my Warlocks very close to um, uh, to to Ashlyn. Um, one thing I can try and do is telekinesis her, but you know what good is that going to do? Um, she's defense 19, so even if I do pick it up, pick her off, um, you know it's going to be too difficult to actually knock her down. Um, so that's that's a real problem right there. Next image, a um, bit of a zoom out. Um, here's the final situation. Um, a lot of stuff is uh, fighting on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, um, I'm hanging back and he has been stuck. And you can see a massive hole where the uh, Lord of the Feast used to be because he exploded in, uh, in a frenzy of killing right next to those jacks and all of the dwarven units, the Ruluk units. Next image. Um, Doppler bark. The Argus moves on to the objective to claim it, to try and get another point. And I do indeed try the Doppler bark against Ashlyn, just in case I had, had hideously good luck. But to get the Doppler bark off, you need a crit, and you need to hit. And I'm up against defense 19 here, and of course the Vanguard can just um, shield guard it. And, um, you know, I'm rolling an extra shoot ice because of Ashlyn's feet. So that didn't happen. Didn't manage to get the hit, but at least I'm able to score a second point and really get a big lead on control points. Next image, um, the heroic Blackclad moves in and lots of very bad photo. Um, there used to be Iris and half a unit of Niss Hunters where that spray was, but um, the awesome, awesome Blackclad moving in and uh, stoning them to death, which I found an extremely hilarious move. Nice, uh, nice play there by the Blackclad getting you know his points tripled uh, in return. Next image after that, the Fulcrum finally coming out to play. He's um, he's collected three Fury points at this point, so um, you can see a bright shining um, <laughs> four-inch AOE template where the Flame Blast is, and um, luckily slightly outside of um, uh, Gorton's uh, solid ground, following up with a uh, lightning um, lightning blast against uh, the Steelheads, getting several kills there. Really cool using the Fulcrum because it's such an imposing piece on the battlefield in such a large game. Next image, um, I have moved forward with the Nalhorn and the Wald Warden into base based contact with the flag. All of the druids have moved up and put down clouds instead of putting AoEs under them. I've just put markers next to them. And of course, elemental uh, protection and counter magic up in the center. Thought about going for it and trying to attack as Jax's turn, but I still didn't. Um, just playing playing it the boring, boring, boring way, and all the ca casters just hanging out in the Swamp Gobbers cloud. And this time it's Kruger who feats to knock back his Jax and prevent him from charging and actually doing some damage onto my Druids and uh, and uh, War Beasts. Uh, a lot is going to be quite hard because I've put down a 4-inch um, forest template from Baldo as well. Next image, uh, Wolf Riders still getting a few more kills against these Hammerfall guys. After the Lord of the Feast, feast shenanigans and uh, some shooting, um, he actually failed a command check, even with a reroll from the flags. That was a bit unlucky. And of course, his uh, Forge Guard um, bringing up the rear very slowly, not able to do much. Um, so looking good. And of course, um, collected a second point in there with the Argus. Next image, um, more action on the right-hand flank. What survives of the uh, Steelhead Cav um, have moved around, having been affected by uh, Kruger's feet. They can't charge. Stannis is in the forest, being uh, shunted in there by the Hurricane as well. And um, the Ogryn's moving forward to try and get some CRA action on the uh, the Gators, but not managing to kill either the Gatorman or the Argus. And um, the Steelheads, what remain of them, are trying to get some hits in as well. A couple of Nits Nits Hunters surviving, and um, Taryn Delarossi and um, her, her boyfriend, from uh, the Merc's book, trying to get some shots off, but uh, not really achieving anything. My uh, feral warp wolf, which you see standing next to the fulcrum, had been reduced to four points, but he ran away after that happened. Kruger healed him for a couple, he regen for a couple more, and just stayed out of the action, because what I can do is later on, I can now charge with him or teleport him up and reclaim that point um, and just get into the action where he's harder to remove, especially with his plus two armor. Next image, um, he moves in with um, his troops. He's actually uh, charged up with or run up with his uh, forge guard and hammerfall. Trying to get some CRAs with the hammerfall, but not really doing it. The uh, warp wolf in the forest is stealthed, so nothing happening there. And um, uh, the vanguard moving in range, I think, to... Um, uh, well, actually, not, not in range to contest the flag at this point. He's going to do something else with Ashland, Ashland I believe. Next image, um, Ashlyn finishes her turn, staying out in the open, killing the rest of the Tharn Wolf, ra uh, wolf ra 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 the Tharn Ravagers, rather. So at this point, because there is no feats from the mercenary player left uh, on the board, 
um, what I decided to do is try and get in there. And just to recap, guys, I know it was an intense game and it was a long night and I've made some casting and, and, and commentary errors. I'm just going to go back on what I said. Turn one, mercenaries move forward. Turn two, Gorton feated uh, to push my guys back into the forest. Turn three, Ashland feats, but Damio doesn't. So I could have sent in, a, uh, in, a, in Megalith or somebody to throw Ashland, but in order to hit her, I needed to hit defense 17, taking into account Ashland's uh, feat. And I just didn't think it was possible, even with a boost, because I'd have to discard my two highest dice. So that's why I didn't try the throw that turn. Turn five for circle, this is turn five, uh, Dam Damiano has used his feet, uh, sorry, Damiano has used his feet during Mercenaries turn four, so now it's a circle of turn five that we're looking at in the photo. So Megalith is teleported forward within five inches of, of Ashland, he's cast Undergrowth as Animus to drop her defense by two, and then he simply tries to telekinesis her and fails the roll. So I will have to get her, um, her back arc around a different way. Going to the next image, um, the Wolf Riders aggressively charge in against the uh, the Forge Guard, or who I believe are the prey target, and uh, killing several of them. So this is them committed, and a bit of a follow-up with the Light Cab movement after that. Next image, um, what's happened here is that um, after Kruger moved forward and the Wild Warden moved forward, um, I attempted a telekinesis on Ashlyn. Now just to um, backtrack a bit, um, I did make a mistake here which I did correct with my opponent. We didn't play this incorrectly. Megalith initially, I, I announced that I was casting Megalith, uh, telekinesis with Megalith. Then I realized Megalith was part of Baldur's battle group, so he doesn't have me um, telekinesis. He can only cast Baldur's spells. So instead we agreed that I'd, I'd roll, in, roll for an Earth Spikes instead, which did hit her, luckily, and did uh, about six points of damage to her even though she was camping you know, a lot of her focus and Damiano gave her plus three armor from his feet. So after she'd taken uh, a whole bunch of damage, um, I then moved up with Kruger himself and telekinesis Ashlyn around so that she would be starting her back arc um, facing the World Guardian. I then teleported the Guardian with my other set of stones right behind um, Ashlyn. He had stone skin up and the World Guardian boosted a hit in her back arc with her um, defense dropped by um, Megalith and just one shot at her because she'd already been reduced down to only maybe eight boxes or something. And um, yeah, it was nice, nice high roll. And of course he has stone skin for power 19. So uh, my backup plan there was going to be able to move the uh, the stalker in there, but I didn't have to. And mind you guys, um, one other thing I tried here was the doppelbark from the Argus, which did hit Ashlyn. So after all of my attempts to telekinesis, I'd forgotten the Argus. So before the Wild Guardian actually went in, I dropped uh, Ashlyn's defense down to seven. So that's why it was much easier for the uh, the Guardian to get the, the kill. So teamwork, that's how you do it. So one of the final acts of the, the, the game of the evening was actually to charge the Stalker in, put Berserk down, and actually kill Dougal, all of his Hammerfall guys, and everything else in range um, apart from my own stuff. So that was quite a hilarious way to finish up with the Stalker. Next photo after that, um, everything else moves forward. The Wild Warden picks up another control point in the center. I've now got five control points. The Fulcrum moves up and starts clearing up the Nis Hunters and the Steelhead Cav. And uh, unfortunately not doing too much damage or, or action with my casters in the center. Cassius didn't really cast a Curse of Shadows or Hellmouth all game, although he was threatening to. I came up with a couple of funny ideas, but never saw the right opportunity. And um, that is that. Going to the next photo, the Feral Wolf uh, charges back into the action, starts to um, tear up some of his infantry, and of course contests his flag, uh, denying my opponent any control points for the evening. Um, and that is it. So I hope you guys enjoyed the, the commentary. What we had to do when it got to Mercenary Turn 5 is that it was 1 o'clock in the morning, he decided to concede the game, there was no way that he could actually kill my casters, they were too well protected, and all of Ashland's battle group was inactive uh, because of her death, so what was inevitably going to happen is it was going to turn into a nutrition war, but I would have had my three casters against his, and it would have been very, very easy for me to pick, up, um, pick apart either his, his remaining casters or his battle group, and I was well, well, well ahead on the uh, control points, and we were playing for, what, five hours anyway, so really uh, entertaining game, um, it could have been a lot more violent a lot of more models could have been lost. We played through five hours and only lost maybe a quarter of our forces each, which you know wasn't that satisfying. But um, next time we play, we'll either allow ourselves more time or play more aggressive casters or a different scenario or different factions. I've got 100 points worth of Minoth I'd like to try. Um, you guys will be aware of the Colossals coming out later this year, so if I get the Minoth ones, which I'm likely to, um, that'll be another opportunity to play at this um, very 
interesting, fascinating uh, level of War Machine, and uh, with a lot of carnage and entertainment and, uh, and really, full, really cool uh, pictures. So thanks for bearing with me through that very long commentary. I'll catch you guys later.